Ah, looks like we're getting people coming in. They're coming in fast. Yeah. Well, we got two people set up for testimonies today, too. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Good morning, Susan. Thank you for your post there. We already have a good question coming in. I want to remind everyone that this is a good time to get your questions in early. Uh, between now and 1045 is the probably the best time to get your questions answered. We already have one from Stephen Posta from Spring, Texas, Doug McComb. We might as well start with those, huh? Hugh, does that, does that sound good to you? That sounds good, sure. Okay, let me get myself out of here. All right, the first question from Stephen Posta from Spring, Texas is please explain the physical characteristics of exactly what made up the boundaries, in quotes, that were established during day two and day three of creation that kept separate the waters below from the waters above. What caused the underground waters to spew forth and contribute to the flooding at the same time as the 40 days of rain? Okay, a couple of questions in there. Uh, yeah, creation day two uh, is a very, it's the most brief statement of the creation days. Basically, the text in Genesis says there's waters below and waters above. Uh, notice with all the other creation days, you got much more uh, detail. And the reason for the limited detail on creation day two is because how extensive a commentary you got in Job. Uh, keep in mind that there's good textual evidence that the content of the book of Job predates that of Genesis by four to six centuries. And uh, you actually have the most extensive accounts of creation in the book of Job, particularly Job 37 uh, through to Job 41. And in Job 38, Job, all of Job 37 and the first half of Job 38 pertain to creation day two. And what you see in those two chapters of Job is it speaks extensively about the water cycle. How uh, there's water in the oceans and streams and lakes below and there's water vapor uh, in the troposphere above and how God designed the water cycle with multiple forms of precipitation. You notice it mentions there in the text uh, that you have snow and hail and a frost. Uh, you've got a rain, uh, you've got dew, you've got mist. And as you read through the text, there are actually references to other forms of precipitation. And it's something I've written about in uh, uh, weathering climate change and uh, improbable planet as well is how in order for advanced life to exist on Earth, we need multiple forms of precipitation. That doesn't work if all you've got is rain or all you've got is snow. You need multiple forms of precipitation in order to make possible human habitation uh, over the whole face of the terrestrial uh, land masses. And Mark, can you remind me what uh, he's talking also about the flood? What was his question about the flood? What caused the underground waters to spew forth and contribute to the flooding at the same time as the 40 days of rain? All right. There, I think it's important to realize that the flood of Noah took place sometime during the last ice age. To say, where do you get that from? Genesis chapter 8 tells us it took seven and a half months for the flood waters to recede uh, after it stopped uh, raining. And for it to, to take that long for flood waters to recede, you would need a huge amount of melting snow and ice, uh, way more than would be available during an interglacial in that part of the world. And so, uh, and uh, that tells us that uh, if it is during the last ice age, that's a time when virtually the entirety of the Persian Gulf uh, was dry land. And uh, geologists tell us that there is an enormous aquifer underneath the Persian Gulf. There's one under the Mesopotamian plain, but the one under the Mesopotamian plain uh, is small compared to the gigantic one under the Persian Gulf. And so we can imagine a tectonic event which would have caused that underground water uh, to burst forth upon the surface. And that's interesting too, because you notice the Persian Gulf uh, is enclosed uh, by uh, 
Now the Gulf of Hormuz, if you look at the Gulf of Hormuz, I wish I had a map here. You can see that there's actually a very uh, narrow uh, uh, strait uh, connecting both ends of the Persian Gulf. And uh, for example, there was a burn there, uh, which is basically a, a big uh, landmass that would actually cause uh, a barrier between the Indian Ocean and uh, the Persian Gulf. Uh, if that were to be broken by a tectonic event, uh, you could have a huge amount of Indian Ocean water coming in to the Persian Gulf and the Mesopotamian Plain and parts of the Arabian Desert. You got the water coming up from below from the aquifer. You got the 40 days and 40 nights of torrential rain. And so you got three major sudden sources of a huge amount of water. And uh, this would explain why the devastation uh, was so immediate and so destructive. So there are no human survivors except for those on board the ark. Uh, in my book, Navigating Genesis, I give you a map showing you the probable extent of Noah's flood. Uh, it's about four times bigger uh, than the Mesopotamian plain, four or five times bigger. So extensive enough that indeed uh, would have wiped out all of humanity at that time. And uh, yeah, the biblical text, as well as genetic evidence tells us uh, that uh, humanity was localized and uh, did not become global. I mean, you see that Genesis 10 and 11 is where you actually see a reference to humanity uh, becoming globally distributed. But before that, humanity was not. So you don't need to flood Australia to wipe out all of humanity because at that time there are no humans in Australia and no domesticated animals of humans in Australia. And that's significant too. A careful reading of Genesis 6, 7, and 8 tells us that the animals that were destroyed by the flood uh, were those uh, that were associated with humans. In other words, uh, the domesticated animals or the animals uh, that had close contact with humans that are in the category of the nephesh creatures. Again, you can get a lot more detail on this in Navigating Genesis. And I just started writing a full-length book on Noah's flood. Uh, it'll be out in a couple of years, uh, but I'm already enjoying uh, getting that ready. But there's five chapters on Noah's flood already in Navigating Genesis. Great, thank you. Doug McComb from Monrovia, uh, Apologizes for asking the question, but he says that it, it really bothers me that in Genesis 1-1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, that the word heaven is singular. I looked the Hebrew word up in Strong's and the word for heaven is Shemayim. And in Strong's lexicon dictionary, the word is stated to be singular. Can you please explain how we get the interpretation of Shemayim to be a reference to all the stars, et cetera, in the universe, if the word is singular? Yeah, I haven't really read that. I mean, Shemayin is basically the plural, so that, that would be heavens. And notice all the translations in English. It's the heavens and the earth. Uh, you do see another, I mean, in Isaiah, for example, you'll find pas passages that talk about heaven and earth. Um, and so you'll see in the translation, English translation, the phrase, the heavens and the earth. You'll see that used nine times in the Old Testament. It's the same Hebrew structure in the original. Uh, and that's contrasted with a more frequent phrase, heaven and earth, which shows up 19 times. And if you look at those 19 instances and compare with a nine in the original Hebrew, it is distinct. Uh, they're not the same. So there is a distinction between heaven and earth and the heavens and the earth. I commented on this in my book, Navigating Genesis, making the point that where you see it translated heaven and earth, that's a reference to the universe uh, plus the heavenly realm that God made uh, for the angels. Whereas the phrase the heavens and the earth is for the universe. Keep in mind in biblical Hebrew, there is no word for the universe. So they have this, they refer to it as a phrase. I mean. Sometimes we do that in English, where we don't have a word, uh, we combine two words. Uh, you know, butterfly would be an example, we combine two words. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'd have to look into that, Doug, and just see exactly what's going on there. 
uh, but there's there clearly is a distinction in the original Hebrew between the phrase translated the heavens and the earth compared to heaven and earth. But yet I have to look at the details again to see what the distinctions are. Thank you. Um, from uh, Spring, Texas, Stephen Posta. Genesis 2.11 says that the first river that flowed from the garden was the Pishon River that flowed around the entire land of Havilah, where the gold was exceptionally pure. If that specific location, now thought to be underwater in the Persian Gulf, could be located, do you think that exceptionally pure gold could be further mined? Or do you think the inhabitants of Havilah exploited those gold mines completely? Okay, good question. Yeah, what you see in Genesis 2, it names four rivers and uh, tells you where the source of the rivers are. It doesn't really tell you where they end up, but it does tell you where they begin and where they flow through. And in terms of the uh, uh, Pishon, it's saying, yeah, it flows through uh, the mountains of Hagalah where there is gold. Now, what's interesting is in terms of the Arabian Peninsula and the nearby uh, Middle Eastern regions, the only place where the ancients found gold uh, were in the mountains of central Western Arabia. So, and that's referred to as the mountains of Havala. And you can actually see in a satellite uh, image that there's a dry riverbed that actually flowed out of those mountains and down into the Persian Gulf. I actually show you an image of that satellite uh, that image uh, in navigating Genesis. And you say, well, why isn't it flowing today? Well, the mountains of Havala during the last ice age uh, had ice and snow on it. They no longer do. And so uh, the Pishon is now a dry riverbed. But you can see where that dry riverbed is in satellite. And the same thing with uh, the river Gihon. Uh, it too is dry. And uh, But during the last ice age, uh, the mountains in the southwestern portion of the Arabian Peninsula had snow and ice on it, and therefore, as they melted, it could uh, feed into the river. The Tigris and Euphrates are rivers that still have water flowing through today, mainly because they get their they get snow and ice melt uh, from the high Ararat Mountains. I mean, Ararat is above seventeen thousand feet, so it's still got snow and ice on it and explain why those two rivers are flowing, whereas the Beat Kihon and the Pishon uh, are not flowing. Uh, you say, is there gold to get there today? Well, there might be uh, little tiny bits and pieces, uh, but that gold was long ago uh, harvested. So uh, it's not worth uh, taking a trip there and trying to get some gold. There are better places that they get gold. And you say, might there be some gold that was washed down by those rivers in the bottom of the Persian Gulf? That's quite likely. Uh, you might want to dredge down there and see if you can find it, uh, but I don't know of anybody doing that. And incidentally, uh, the gold that was in the mountains of Havala wasn't a huge amount. It's not like uh, some of the gold fields you see in Australia or Canada or South Africa or uh, Russia. So I don't think you're going to find a lot of gold in the bottom of the Persian Gulf, uh, but I think you would find some. Thank you. Ron, <clears throat> Ron Hawking asks, if God is unable to look upon sin, how is it possible for Satan to have an audience with God on, in the book of Job? I read that it really wasn't Satan, but a devil's advocate. So God could show humans a model in how to handle suffering from Ron Hawking. Yeah, well, you know, God cannot uh, look upon sin unless it's paid for. And so is a separation. I mean, uh, you know, God was engaging uh, human beings in the Old Testament, uh, even though that their sin had not yet been atoned for by the work of Christ. Uh, but the relationship that God had uh, with humans is different in the New Te Old Testament than it is in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, this was represented in the temple of worship system, where they had a holy of holies, and uh, only the high priest could go into the holy of holies and only once a year, and there was a very thick veil uh, that, uh, you know, four inches thick, uh, 20 feet by 20 feet, uh, that separated uh, the Holy of Holies uh, from the rest of the temple. You know, what's interesting is it tells us in the New Testament 
uh, that when Christ died on the cross, that very thick velvet curtain uh, was rent in two, ripped in two. Can you imagine the kind of miracle that had to happen to tear a rip from top to bottom uh, in a, a piece of velvet cloth, four inches thick, 20 feet by 20 feet? But the New Testament tells us that's what happened and basically made the point there's no longer a barrier uh, between human beings uh, and God uh, thanks to the work of Christ on the cross. So we can come into the presence. That's what communion's all about. When we take the bread, the bread is basically symbolizing that thanks to the death of Christ on the cross and his payment for our sins, we have direct access to God the Father. The fact that we have direct access and God treats us like we're not a sinner any longer and has a loving fellowship with us doesn't mean God wasn't engaging human beings before that point. He was. But there was a difference in the level of engagement, for example, what God had with Adam and Eve before they sinned and what they had afterwards. God dealt with Adam and Eve after they sinned, but it was a different situation. So that's the distinction. And so I think the question is basically an argument of semantics. What does it mean when it says God cannot look on sin? That means he can't accept it as sin free. Can God still have in engagement and conversations with fallen humans and fallen angels? He definitely did. We see lots of examples of that in the Old Testament, New Testament too, for that matter. So I think it's quite uh, possible that it was Satan himself that was having a debate with God that we see in Job chapter one, rather than a representative. So God can still converse and engage just and can't treat uh, Satan as a sin-free being and have a kind of fellowship that would be possible uh, if indeed uh, there was no sin there at all. Thank you. We're at the uh, start time for the regular session. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I'd like to begin our time because, you know, Mark and I were involved uh, yesterday. It was an all-day workshop on artificial intelligence in the Christian faith. And uh, so we both participated in that, also participated in some dialogue and discussion afterwards. I'm gonna ask Mark uh, for his perspective on this. And Mark, I'm gonna be segueing uh, to a brand new scientific discovery, uh, this paper uh, that was published in uh, Science uh, on uh, basically talking about the social transfer of different emotions. Uh, between the uh, soulless creatures. And that's actually something we talked about in the conference yesterday. So uh, this is going to be a great setup for me. Uh, I want to get your perspective because I really didn't hear you say much yesterday. Uh, and so I'd love to hear what your perspective was uh, on our uh, workshop. I didn't say much yesterday because I was a sponge. There was just so much going on. It was wonderful to just listen. <laughs> Well, I've got, I could actually see your face there. I said, you know, I bet you Mark's got a lot to share with us. So <laughs> uh, you're wrong. <on. laughs> well, the, the interesting thing about the conference was particularly the people who are invited. So it started out with John Lennox, who's probably one of the most interesting people in the world that you could listen to as a Christian apologist. And he had a discussion on the, the limits of AI from the perspective of a mathematician and the, the distinction between AI as an artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence, distinguishing the two because that equivocation occurs and people don't know that occurs. Another person who spoke was Zachary Young. Hey, did the, you just tell us what the difference is for, for those two? Because Well, one of them is a, a, nothing more than a repetition or a mimic of machine activity. So AI, in one sense is nothing more than a, a computational exercise. So a computer going through particular functions to produce an output is AI. If it, if it artificially acts to do what humans would ordinarily do. But artificial general intelligence is much deeper. It is intended to be something that mimics not just what uh, physically or um, cognitively a human could do, but supposedly do more than, than that. And that was where the, the distinction arose that I think John Lennox was trying to make is that 
the artificial general intelligence may mimic what humans can do in terms of having consciousness, but <clears throat> it cannot do it ultimately because consciousness is different from the activities of a machine. So what he said was that people are afraid of the artificial general intelligence. And part of the reason is they're conflating it with regular AI and they think that both of them are the same thing when they really are not. So that was his perspective from a, um, a mathematical position or a position that, that wasn't a, 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 a technician in, in the uh, technology of AI. Now that is interesting because one of the other speakers was, and that was Zachary Leung, L-E-U-N-G, who has been in technology for, for decades. And he works on neural networks and he works on artificial intelligence. And I think one of the most interesting things that he talked about was how difficult it was for he and other graduate students at MIT to even define AI. So one of the problems they had was to try and figure out what, when we talk about artificial intelligence, what are we saying it really is? And one of the, the stunning results they came up with, with, number one, they didn't come up with any definition. They could not come up with a definition. And number two, what they did do in order to, to substitute for not having a clear, rigorous definition was a set of examples or exemplars of what count as artificial intelligence. And the two examples he gave are two examples I never would have dreamed of in my, my wildest imagination would come from MIT as examples of artificial intelligence. The first one was an airplane. Now he wasn't talking about the engineering of the pilots. He's talking about the airplane as something that can fly, that can do something that humans would ordinarily try to make happen, but the, the machine itself does it. The other one, which was even simpler and more elegant was the thermal tumbler, you know, something that you can pour coffee in and it stays warm or pour ice water in and it stays cold. I never would have thought of that, either one of those as artificial intelligence the way he did. So he described artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence differently from the way that, that uh, John Lennox did. And he, he said, AI is pretty much like what John Lennox described in that it's, it's intended to be something simple that can, be, can, can do activities that, that are repetitious or need speed that humans shouldn't be or can't do or, or the machines can do better. So you can't hold hot water in your hands and make it more thermally efficient than it would be in that thermal cup. So that's what AI was for him. But the artificial general intelligence, and he used another term, I think, uh, I forget what it was, but anyway, it was along the same lines. He was trying to, to distinguish it from John Lennox's version. And that was one that included neural networks. And he said, what, what people think is that once you get neural networks involved, and a neural network is a whole collection of artificial intelligence activities. So you can have one machine doing one thing, another machine doing something else, have them all doing things and then talking to each other and then improving their performance as they go along. And what he said was that you will never get from that what we call natural intelligence or the ability to be creative or the ability to be self-reflective or do any of those kinds of things. And so he said that uh, th that's a, it's a hopeless case to believe that artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence will ever create the kind of cyborg that will outdo us and make be, be more creative and more intelligent and have the, the consciousness that we have because the systems just can't do that. They will not do that. And then he ex explained how that is. And, and I won't go into that because I don't remember all of it. I have to think it through. The next person that was uh, very fascinating to listen to, and I forget his name, but he was an ethicist. And what he described was the ethical quandaries that arise in all forms of artificial intelligence or even artificial general intelligence. And he said, are there too many to name because there's just too many technologies. But the upshot of what he was getting at was that artificial intelligence under any conditions is morally neutral, but that it's people who turn it into evil or people who use it for good. 
But he also said that we have to make sure that we pay attention to those things because every one of them has unforeseen consequences that we have to constantly be testing for and evaluating morally and ethically. And Christians are uniquely qualified to do that and that we should help train our children to become people who can get into those technologies and influence that. And we should influence that by talking about these things and the, the consequences of them in the uh, open public forum. So that was fascinating and useful. And then the last one was JP Moreland who described different ideas on what consciousness was and why artificial intelligence or any kind of machine will never create a consciousness. And he described consciousness in some detail and philosophical detail, which I found absolutely fascinating. But in particular, for example, he mentioned a couple of things. One of them was that um, consciousness is not merely the, an object perceiving something, which is what he called the reductionist idea, which is that we're nothing more than a brain. But he says consciousness is more than that and it can't be reduced to the brain because the brain itself cannot think about itself. In other words, it, it doesn't have ideas about its ideas. And the, the, the brain doesn't have free will. No mechanical object, no merely physical object can think about its intentions. It can't think in abstract forms about things that don't even exist. And so he went on to describe different aspects of consciousness that are completely incapable of being acquired by any kind of machine or any kind of solid matter for that matter. But he did say the brain does interact with our consciousness, but no one, no one knows how. And so with those four people, it gave us a really good perspective on what the limitations of AI are, how consciousness can be defined and can be excluded from any possibility in AI. And ultimately, our role as Christians in the morality and the ethics of AI and how we have a, an obligation to engage those. Yeah. And uh, a lot of discussion amongst all the participants about uh, the ethics of artificial intelligence. That really became a big deal. Health aspects, the military aspects, uh, you know, how we police it, how we deal with uh, you know, criminals and uh, terrorists and rogue nations uh, and their abuse of it and just realizing what kind of dangers we face but also what kind of opportunities we face. I mean, uh, you know, just what's going on right now with these vaccines, uh, that would not have been possible without the use of artificial intelligence. That's right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you see what's going on with uh, facial recognition and how that could be abused by a government to control its uh, citizens. So uh, it's here. Uh, there's no way of stopping it. You know, always people think, well, we need to legislate and put to a halt scientific advance. But uh, the genie's out of the bottle. And when the genie's out of the bottle, you got to deal with it. So uh, I thought that was one of the better things. But I also really appreciated, like you did, how three of the speakers made the point uh, that human consciousness is not physical. They're not going to explain it with physics and chemistry and biology. You know, our brain is like a computer, but there's a mind, there's a spirit that's controlling that computer. Uh, the brain by itself uh, doesn't have consciousness. Uh, it's a tool that's used by our conscious being. So, uh, well, thank you for that report. And uh, we're going to have some time for Q&A later. Uh, but right now I'm going to segue I mean, I've been told that people really like my discussions on scientific discoveries. So I'm trying to bring a new one every week uh, to complement our Bible teaching uh, that we do. And uh, the one I'm going to talk about today actually ties right in uh, with the workshop that Reasons to Believe sponsored. By the way, our intent is to continue sponsoring uh, these science research uh, workshops uh, for the purpose of advancing Reasons to Believe's a testable creation model. So we talked for decades that we have this testable model, uh, but uh, you've got to continue to bring it to the test. And so that's why we keep inviting top scholars, uh, Christians, as well as non-Christians uh, to uh, critique our model, 
and to help us advance the model and make it more testable. So uh, that's part of what we're doing here. Uh, but you know, just a, a couple of weeks before uh, the this uh, workshop was uh, sponsored and uh, done, uh, this paper got published in Science. And uh, it's called, uh, the title is, it's a neuroscience paper, Anterior Cingulate Inputs to Nucleus Accumbens Control the Social Transfer of Pain and Analgesia, analgesia which is a technical term for pain relief. And there's a lot more in this paper than just that. Uh, it's written by uh, three neuroscientists, headed up by uh, Monica Smith. And uh, so I'm going to just give you a quick review of what's in this paper and how it actually uh, gives us more evidence uh, for the Christian faith. So let me share a screen here, so because I've prepared some visuals on this. Okay, what happened to my person? Wrong computer, that always helps. One thing about Zoom, to make it work, you got to run with two computers. Here we go. Okay, you should all be seeing my first slide. And hey, this is just a slide for all of you who don't get to ask your question. Uh, we try to allow quite a bit of time for Q&A in the Paradoxes class. I just want to let you know that I and all the rest of the scholars at Reasons to Believe do have a Facebook and a Twitter page where we take your questions. So feel free to engage us there. And if you're not already a subscriber, Reasons to Believe has a 24 seven YouTube channel uh, where we're putting up uh, video clips uh, on a daily basis. And uh, again, just to remind you, if you want uh, more content on uh, our series that we're doing on the benefits of suffering, the physics and the benefits of suffering. A lot of this content is in why the universe is the way it is, but uh, we've been putting in some updates as well. And just to remind you, you can get a free chapter of that book. Anyone can get a free chapter at reasons.org uh, slash uh, Ross. And this is kind of the theme we've been doing the past few weeks. I'm hoping to wrap this up. I was going to try to wrap it up today, but we might need another week before we wrap this up and launch a new series. But the series is on why God allows suffering, what's the physics behind the suffering that he takes us through, and particularly, what are the benefits? And the Bible is really clear uh, that there's a whole different set of benefits of physical suffering for the believer, for the follower in Jesus Christ, than for the non-believer. And so uh, the suffering that believers go through is distinct from the sufferings that the non-believers go through. And uh, so anyway, those of you who've been with us have seen that. And uh, we've been making a component of this Paradoxes class to transition from a webinar to a web meeting. And in a web meeting, we can all turn on our cameras and our microphones and engage one another. It's an attempt to build some social interaction into the Paradoxes class. And yes, the paper I'm talking about today is all about uh, social uh, interaction. So we're actually gonna do a little bit of that. That'll be the last part of the Paradoxes class. And this is the URL you're gonna need to get into that component uh, of the Paradoxes class. Uh, it's not quite the same as being in person where we get to have treats and drinks and uh, you know fellowship with one another. That's the best we can do uh, in the midst of this pandemic. So uh, with that, uh, let me get into this paper. And basically it's a research to look into uh, what's happening scientifically uh, with social interaction of uh, mammals. You know, and all mammals engage in some degree of social interaction, some species more than others. And basically this was a set of experiments done on mites. You say, well, why didn't they do it on human beings? Well, they also wanted to understand the brain pathways uh, for the social interaction. And this meant that they were gonna have to uh, do some significant intervention uh, that wasn't exactly pleasant. So for ethical reasons, they did not do it on human beings. Uh, they did it on mice. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence in the neuroscience that tells us that mice and rats are good proxies 
for what happens in humans and actually gives us enough insight that when we do do experiments on human beings, uh, we've got some guidelines uh, to help us uh, get the details that we need to get. But uh, the first experiment that was done by this team is they, uh, they, they basically had mice that were living together. So they had kind of this large cage with mice in it. And so uh, both of these mice here are cage mates. So they're, they know one another. And they took one of the mice uh, out of that cage and uh, you know, gave it a shot. And the shot basically induced significant pain uh, in that mouse. And then you've got a second mouse here who is a cage mate uh, who didn't get the shot. And so one got this pain inducing shot, the other one didn't. But they let these two mice engage one another socially for an hour. And they discovered after one hour of social interaction, uh, the mouse that didn't have the shot uh, that induced pain began to experience the same pain that the mouse that did. And so basically showing uh, that there's some social transfer of pain from one mouse that is suffering to a second mouse that's not suffering. And you say, what's happening in this social interaction? This is basically a mouse model for empathy. And so the mouse uh, that didn't have the shock uh, was empathizing uh, with the mouse that did. And after an hour of this social interaction, began to manifest the same symptoms of pain as the mouse has. And this has been observed in humans. We've seen this happen with humans, uh, but this is an experiment uh, where they're actually able to uh, directly measure this and discover, hey, an hour of social engagement is enough to make this happen. Uh, but they went on uh, to discover uh, that, here we go. So here's the mouse and both mice uh, are experiencing this. And so, uh, let's, yeah, let me back up here. Okay, so now you got both mice experiencing uh, this pain where only one mouse got the shot that was inducing the pain. What the experimenters next did, here you got these two mice that are having pain and, uh, and so what they do is they give a shot uh, to one mouse who basically gives them some morphine. You know, morphine is a drug uh, that helps alleviate pain. And so here's a, you know, here are these two mice that have pain. And uh, so um, you give a shot to one and suddenly the mouse has no pain. After an hour of social interaction, where here you got a mouse in pain and a mouse uh, that uh, doesn't have pain, and after an hour of a social interaction, what you discover is that even the mouse uh, that has the pain no longer has pain. Again, this is the empathy working uh, in, in an opposite way. Now, what they discovered is, if you go back uh, to this mouse that has pain, uh, it doesn't make a difference uh, whether the pain that mouse is experiencing is socially induced or induced by real physical pain, you know, like an injury, uh, a shock, uh, or uh, some drug uh, that induces pain. And by the way, the pain that they induced with the shock was designed to mimic arthritic pain, because after all, there's a lot of humans that suffer significant arthritic pain. And so that's what they were trying to mimic here. And so, you know, you can have a mouse that's experiencing arthritic pain for real, not just through social transfer, uh, but you give them, uh, you know, some social interaction, and you discover uh, that the pain is relieved. And these uh, researchers here basically made the point: this has potential for alleviating uh, pain in humans. And so they said we could significantly lessen the use of morphine, for example, and other pain relieving drugs. Uh, by simply uh, taking the person that has this pain and put them in a social environment where they get to engage another human that has experienced pain relief. And so you've got these two humans. Uh, and so what they could do is actually say, give a morphine shot to one human, uh, not to a bunch of other humans, 
but had the one that got the morphine shot socially engage those that didn't, and you basically get the same benefit uh, for all of them. So basically, they're making a point. There's a potential. Now, again, this experiment was done in mice. We need to do it uh, with humans, but it could be done in a non-invasive way where we basically do an experiment It's okay. Uh, we've got uh, 10 people uh, in a hospital ward, for example, that are experiencing significant cancer pain uh, or significant arthritic pain or some other kind of pain. And uh, we give uh, drugs uh, to one or two of those individuals and uh, they experience relief from pain. The whole group gets to see uh, these uh, humans being relieved from pain and basically say, will this work with humans? Uh, where say you've got a dozen people under extreme pain, uh, you give uh, drugs for pain relief to one or two of them, will that bestow benefit in all 12? And if that really pans out, uh, then there's a way we could really reduce uh, the uh, risk of people getting addicted to these pain relieving drugs. And uh, it'd be less expensive, of course, uh, and recovery might be faster. That's something the researchers also are suggesting is this, this may be a means uh, for more rapid recovery. It you know, wouldn't be wonderful if you can get pain relief without having to take these more uh, invasive drugs. And so that was one set of experiments uh, that they did. They did another one where, again, they took mice uh, that were socially bonded to one another. And in one case, they gave an electric shock uh, to one mouse. And what they noticed was you don't need an hour of social interaction within a few seconds, and it might be even less. Uh, if you, uh, you know, basically what happens is that electric shock induces fear in the mouse. And so that fear is quickly transferred uh, to another mouse uh, where there's a social bond uh, between the mice. But they notice this happens much more rapidly uh, than it does with pain uh, or with pain relief. Okay. The main reason why they worked on mice, they actually wanted to determine what's happening in the brain when this is going on. And so they used a, a more invasive approach uh, where uh, they basically give an electric shock or a shock uh, that induces pain. So they're trying to induce these different emotions of pain, pain relief, uh, or fear, and then actually seeing what's happening uh, with uh, you know, uh, what's going on in the brain and then actually tracing uh, through electric roads of the brain of the mice and seeing what's going on there. And what they were discovering uh, was that indeed there's different brain pathways uh, for fear than there is for pain and pain relief. And they're basically suggesting these experiments need to be extended to a completely, uh, a very wide range of different emotions. Uh, but you know, this next slide basically shows you uh, a human brain. And uh, what they discovered is the relevant parts of the brain uh, would be the anterior cingulate uh, cortex, uh, the basal lateral amygdala, and the nucleus accumbens. And so the anterior cingulate cortex is uh, basically uh, the place or the seat of emotions. Uh, but then there, how you respond to these motions uh, is determined by the nucleus accumbens and the basal lateral uh, amygdala. And this next slide here uh, shows you the locations of these different regions in the human brain. And uh, it's similar in the mouse brain. Mouse brain obviously is much smaller and uh, you know, it doesn't have uh, the range of lobes that the human brain does. Uh, but in terms of uh, the emotions and the pathways for what happens to these emotions, uh, there it's it's very similar uh, to uh, in mice, rats, and the humans. And basically, what the research was showing them is that in terms of pain and pain relief, what's happening is you're getting communication between the anterior cingulate cortex and the nucleus accumbens, but you need about an hour of social engagement. Uh, for that social transfer of pain or pain relief to work. In the case of um, uh, fear, uh, you get a different pathway. 
uh, where it's going from the interior cingulate cortex to the basal, lateral, and uh, amygdala, and the response is much faster. And of course, this I would argue is a design feature uh, that God put into the brains of the higher animals, because you're going to want a much more rapid fear response. I mean, if there's a lion that's stalking a tribe of, uh, you know, uh, uh, zebras, for example, and one zebra gets alerted to the wrist, you want that rapidly transferred uh, throughout the whole uh, herd of uh, zebra. And, uh, you know, we've actually seen that happen. Um, when we've been to uh, trips to Africa, we can actually see how rapidly uh, that is transferred. And it's uh, quite amazing uh, for my wife and I to have that experience, just seeing how rapidly uh, that fear response uh, can be transferred. But this is the actual brain pathway uh, that uh, makes that work. Now, this is kind of where the paper ends, uh, but of reading the paper, and I'm actually showing the paper to my son. My son is now applying for my younger son uh, for a postdoctoral fellowship in the clinical neuroscience. So uh, we get to share uh, neuroscience papers frequently. Uh, but it's like, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential uh, philosophical and spiritual implications that comes from this research. And I love the paper because it's basically paving the way for where future research can go. Now, let's not just look at pain and pain relief and fear. Let's look at a broader range of emotion. And, uh, you know, there are uh, handicapped individuals who find it difficult to experience and express empathy. This research might help, uh, might develop therapeutic responses to help people. Uh, my son is very interested in this about, you know, people who are emotionally handicapped and uh, how this factors in uh, to crime statistics, et cetera. So there's actually ways that we might be able to help people deal with these issues. Uh, but in terms of uh, what we see uh, in scripture about how God created a life, the first origin of life was life that's purely physical, and life that's physical and soulish, referring to the birds and mammals and the higher reptilian species, and last of all, uh, to the unique life form on Earth, human beings that are physically soulish and spiritual, and basically makes the point that I think is drawn out in this paper: in order for humans to be able to domesticate uh, birds and mammals, it's important that we share in common. Uh, certain designs. And so uh, this next slide here uh, basically looks at uh, some of the designs you need. Of course, you're going to need common physical designs. In other words, the way our senses operate uh, need to be similar. If we're going to be able to communicate with one another at a social level, there needs to be uh, significant physical similarities in the way we move about, uh, the way our faces are structured the way we communicate our emotions uh, physically, the way we uh, read one another. I mean, uh, you particularly see this with domesticated dogs is that uh, they're quite good at uh, expressing uh, facial, uh, you know, things that communicate their emotional state. And you're gonna need common emotional designs. So it's important uh, that uh, humans, birds and mammals uh, share in common uh, different emotional states and the way they express those emotional states. I mean, after all, what we see in the book of Job is that God had designed these soulish animals to emotionally bond with us, uh, to submit to us, and to serve and please us. And for that to be possible, these animals have to be able to read our emotions. We need to be able to read the emotions of these animals in order to make this possible. And that therefore, we would anticipate that indeed, there would be commonalities in the way the brains of these different animals are, are structured. And we would expect that there would be common pain response designs and common uh, social uh, engagement uh, designs. In other words, we'd expect that we would see amongst all these creatures uh, that they'd be able to uh, socially engage in similar ways. The thing that this uh, paper uh, really brought out that I think is significant is that uh, uh, you know, we're basically tying in empathy with social engagement and emotional expression. 
So it's important that these animals be able to express their emotions in the commonly designed ways. And again, this is something my colleague Fazerana has been working on. You know, it's a common design uh, for common descent. Uh, but this is something we talked about yesterday in the workshop was the distinctions between the body and the mind uh, or the body and the consciousness. And uh, it was J.P. Moreland that made the point uh, that the mind controls the body. The body does not control the mind. The mind controls the body. Uh, something I thought about when I was uh, listening to the different speakers yesterday, you know, what's distinct is that the body is subject to thermodynamics. The body is subject to entropy. So it's decaying. This has been a principle we've had in our teaching series uh, here on uh, suffering, is what's distinct is the spirit within us, the mind or the consciousness is not subject to thermodynamics. When our physical body dies, uh, our consciousness, our spirit continue to live. And so that's not subject to thermodynamics. And it basically uh, underlines the reason why we're never going to get general artificial intelligence uh, or uh, what we call strong artificial intelligence is that uh, strong artificial intelligence is attempting to duplicate the operation of the spirit, the mind, and that's something that's beyond physics and chemistry. And so it's not subject to the laws of physics. And if we're trying to get something not subject to the laws of physics uh, through things that are subject to the laws of physics, there will be a fundamental barrier. And I think that's one of the things that all four speakers were drawing out yesterday. By the way, all four speakers also had a panel of experts and engage them. That's what we're trying to do in workshops, not just have speakers, but actually have serious critique and engagement on uh, what they're expressing. The body decays, the mind does not. The body is passive, the mind is active. There's a point that J.P. Morley has made in several of his books, is that uh, the body passively reacts to what, so it's the mind that's actually controlling uh, what the body does. Uh, so the real, living human being is in the mind and in consciousness. Matter is incapable of consciousness, again, because consciousness is not a physical entity. And what was brought out in this paper that, that I've been reviewing these past few minutes, empathy controls our emotions. And so what we've noticed is people that are incapable uh, through some chemical problem in their brain or through some brain defect, they're not able uh, to express emotions. Uh, and so it's empathy that controls the expression of emotions or the receiving of these emotions. And I thought what really came through the paper, empathy strongly correlates with social engagement. If you don't have the social engagement, the empathy is not there. And the greater the social engagement, uh, then the more strongly empathy could work in such a way as to transfer uh, emotions. I thought it was uh, really interesting how empathy can so powerfully control our emotions is that it can actually communicate pain relief uh, without the use of any drugs uh, whatsoever. Uh, so empathy correlates uh, with social engagement. And you know, when I was reading the paper, it brought to mind what was going on uh, when my father was in his last days. Uh, you know, he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. Uh, and when they diagnosed it, it was so advanced, they said, you know, Mr. Ross, you've only got a few weeks to live. In fact, they thought he had only two weeks to live. And they put him in this really nice uh, facility uh, in uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. We went to visit him there. But uh, it's a facility uh, that... Uh, uh, it's a hospice facility for people that basically have only got two or three weeks to live. And they let people bring in their pets, let them have their family come in. And so they really emphasize this social engagement. But while, while, while I was there, my wife and I were there with my father uh, during his last days. And actually this facility was for people who are fully conscious uh, with just days or weeks to live. And we got to witness people, for example, I remember this one man 
or the nurses were telling us he's going to die today. Uh, but he was conversing with his family. Uh, he had his pet dog there with him. And uh, I could see that the dog was experiencing the same level of pain uh, that this man was experiencing. The bond between that man and the dog was so strong uh, that the dog uh, was actually receiving the same pain he was. I could tell the dog was in immense pain, even though there was nothing physical to adjust that pain. And, uh, you know, my mother's been a nurse. She's been with people who have passed away too. And she says, often what she has seen is where there's a strong bond uh, between the human who's within their last hours uh, and a pet that's with them at that time, how frequently it has happened where they both die in the same minute, uh, that the transfer emotions can be that strong. And my mother actually got to see that not just once or twice, uh, but multiple occasions. And so we got to see a little bit of that uh, during my last, uh, my last days. But I think this also has a bearing on what we've been going through in this past year with this pandemic. We've not had the social engagement that is typical of a normal uh, human society. And uh, there indeed has been a loss of empathy. There has been a loss of emotional transfer. And I think our society has suffered beyond just the physical consequences of the pandemic. Uh, we've suffered at the level uh, of our minds and our, our consciousness. Well, that's enough for that. I'll be happy to take questions on that uh, during or at Q&A time, uh, but I wanna kind of set things up uh, for uh, our uh, remaining uh, day or two uh, with our series here. And this, this again uh, is the URL you're gonna need uh, to get into the meeting. You say, why don't we in a meeting right now? Well, meetings can be crashed and uh, we had some Zoom bombing problems. That's why we always have the class as a, a web meeting we only advertise publicly the web meeting, uh, but once you're part of the web meeting, we can transfer you into uh, the, uh, uh, from the webinar into the web meeting. But yeah, we've been going through the passages in the New Testament that basically speak about how followers of Jesus Christ can benefit from the suffering and can actually welcome the suffering, look forward to the suffering because of the great joy it's gonna bring us and also the great ministry benefits that are going to flow from the suffering that God has been giving us. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the passages. You can do that. Uh, all of these paradoxes, uh, uh, sessions that we have, episodes, are video recorded. And so you can go to paradoxes.org and you can download MP3s for free, no charge, uh, from the paradoxes.org uh, website. So if you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, you can go there and see our teaching on the passages. But the couple of passages I've set up for people to give testimonies, we do, do have two people lined up uh, to give testimonies. And uh, Mark, if you could uh, make as participants, uh, you know, John Belling and uh, Phil Maddox, those are the two people that are up today. Okay. So John David Belling and uh, uh, Phil Maddox, uh, make them a co-host because in a couple of minutes, uh, less than a minute, I'm going to actually have them uh, share with us. And what I've asked each of them to do, we've been doing this for several weeks, is to give a personal testimony of how Romans 8.28 or Philippians 1.12 has uh, worked uh, in uh, your life. And the whole point of Romans 8.28 is when we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, there's always a big silver lining to every moment of suffering we go through, uh, with just two conditions. It'll happen for anyone who loves God and has been called according to his purpose, is actually involved uh, in the ministry on, uh, on behalf of Christ. Uh, and one reason why I've been having several of you give a testimony, I've given some testimonies, we've had several of you and the class give testimonies is I think God wants us to keep a better inventory of the good things that have happened to us through the suffering he's taken through us. We all need to be ready to give a testimony at the drop of a hat to anyone who asks, uh, you're okay. 
how has this happened to impact your life? And the other passage, and so I'm basically asking uh, both Phil and John uh, to give an account of an event in their life that looked like it could only work out for bad, or at the time you're going through the suffering, it seemed to you there's no way this could possibly work out for good, but in due time, it did indeed work out for something way better than anything you could have imagined at that time. Uh, alternately, you can give a testimony of Philippians 1.12. Paul speaks in Philippians and says, what has happened to me? And he gives a long litany of the suffering he's gone through. It says in every single case, the suffering God took me through helped to advance the gospel. I've given a couple of testimonies of how that's happened to me. I got a couple more I'm prepared to give. But hey, John, <coughs> well, uh, you can take it away uh, with either Romans 8.28 uh, or uh, Philippians uh, 1.12. And so in terms of uh, what's going on with Philippians 1.12, how do the persecutions, trials, and suffering we go through advance the gospel? How can we make our persecutions, trials, and sufferings not better advance the gospel? Well, Phil, you already gave one testimony. I know you got another one prepared. Uh, so John, I'm going to let you go first because I don't think any of you have actually heard from you uh, before. So with that, I'm going to stop the share feature so that we can uh, get both John and Phil up. Here we go. Yeah, so so John, go for it. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Ross and, and everybody in this in this Paradox class. It's been been a pleasure to to, to join you guys um, these last couple of weeks hey, John, and months. Tell us where you're from. Yeah, so for the, those, um, I, I, I'm residing in the UK at the moment. Um, I, I've been living in the UK since 2008. I went to the University of Liverpool here, um, but originally was born, born in Hong Kong. Um, and I, I only knew about Dr. Ross um, as my dad was, was, was teaching in the University of Hong Kong. Um, professor of physics there and and he you know he introduced me to to to, to dr ross's idea on you know old earth creationism and 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 which which leads me to to, to part of my testimony today um so yeah speaking to you from the uk and, and greetings from you know to you guys there in the us and wherever you're watching from um but so my, my testimony starts with obviously i was um you know i, I grew up in a um christian home thankfully um, so I was exposed to the gospel very early on, um, got it from church, but it was actually my mom who, who actually gave me the, the, the gospel talk and, and really verified, um, you know, heaven and hell and, and, and Christ being the only way um, to, 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 you know, to be made right and, and go to heaven. So, you know, accepted Christ at a very early age, um, age of seven, was baptized at um, not nine years old, um, and then... Um, and and I suppose my, my journey of faith grew um, since my, um, my 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 high school years, um, and and I suppose my 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 love for witnessing for Christ um, that's where it all started because you know it's 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 no no fact uh, sorry it's no surprise that being a Christian in today's society is is the most popular. Um, you know, way to live, right? So obviously, uh, I'm a teenager telling my friends about Christ, what you do over the weekend, I, you know, I went to church. So, so, you know, it, my high school days was very much a, a testing of my faith. And, and, and into, into the person I am today, which is, I'm very big on telling people about Christ, but also the the validity of 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 christianity and how it's not just it's not a myth you know we can't we can't we can't um uh, liken christ to the tooth fairy you know or any mythological you know f um, figure like that and and hence why um i'm grateful for i be i was grateful and i've been helped by dr ross's work william lane craig you know loads of apologists that I that I, I got to know through my dad and also my, my dad who was also very big on linking um, science and faith together um, but my so so I would say my, my growth as a Christian 
teenage years developed and then went on to university that was a that's what that's another field of, of witness for me um again talking to muslims atheists and obviously i'm learning new things and and hearing oh wow i didn't know that i didn't know um that that that, that was a strong argument for, from the muslims or, or an atheist so you know I, I was very much growing up growing in my my apologetics work um as a student at university where, where I, I studied physics as well um but in 2010 so you know it's 2021 so just over 10 years ago um, my dad passed away um and, and this for me was was real um test of faith because you know he was very much a hero to me you know in terms of uh, you know, being this great witness of, of, of uh, science and faith and, and obviously personally, right, he, he was my dad. And, and for me, obviously, my friends knew I had lost my dad, you know, and, and I used it. Um, I always I remember the day, a uh, couple of days after my dad passed away, I, I posted something on Facebook from Job, you know, naked. I came from my mother's womb. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. <clears throat> but blessed be the name of the Lord. So. But but uh, the po the point um, the point being is that that was that was true for me um, back then and it's true for me um, now and um, the the when when I witness to to people and and we have this age old question of why does God allow suffering um, I I can always bring this personal story story <coughs> story to them that. Um, you know, God is still good, um, despite despite the trials we 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 go through, and um, what 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 I learned from, and I still learn to this day, um, you know, uh, when 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 God takes away things from us, when we go through trials, the verse that I picked that I want to quote is in Isaiah fifty three three. Um, uh, where the prophet says he talking about Christ, he was despised. So Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. So, 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 so for me, I can always, um, you know, I always bring, I always point people to the cross, right? So, so they say, hey, you know, what, if there's a good God, why, why does he allow suffering? And I say, well, look what happened to the cross at, at the cross. The ultimate sacrifice, on the ultimate suffering, uh, was underwent by Jesus. Jesus experienced the ultimate suffering on the cross. And I say, hey, that's the God that created the heavens and the earth. He can empathize with you. He empathized with me, and 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 so um, I use that experience. That that uh, you know, I, I and and as a result, actually, since 2010, my relationship with God got really really close. And um, yeah, so 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 it, it not that that verse that we've been studying in Romans eight twenty eight, uh, God works for the good of those. Uh, I, I want to. I'll just read it out. Um, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who being called according to His purpose. And I like this next bit, twenty nine. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. And for me, that's the, that's that's the the. The, the main aim of, of, of suffering or one of the aspects, because when we go through suffering, we, bec we become more and more like Christ, you know? So I feel, I felt that um, as I experienced that loss of my father, I, 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 I felt a little bit of what Christ felt on the cross and I can be more empathetic to people who, who have, you know, lost loved ones as a result. Um, so, so that, so that's one way I, I view that verse um that, that that god has helped me um uh, another another personal thing which which i was debating to share or not but but i, I will share it in a way hopefully in hope that it will encourage some people is is in the relationship era uh, uh sorry um area of my life um you know when i went to university i asked several girls out and 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 got rejections and so on um but for me, it, it, it really taught me um, how to love and not to love people who love you back. And, and if one thing, one lesson we can learn from, well, I hope you can learn from, from my experience is the character of Christ. If Romans 8.29 is the ultimate purpose is for us to become more and more like Christ, 
well, what's the ultimate character of, of God? He loves the unlovable, right? He loves sinners. And for me, what I learned from these rejections is, hey, you know, it, it, it's okay. I, I should love people for, for who they are. And it also taught me to be less judgmental, to be more humble. And, and yeah, just to have more of that love that God, uh, you know, that God loves us. And, and if anything, I mean, I think about today's world um, and I think about, you know, U.S. and all the, the protests and, and Christians on both sides, because I know it's a touchy, sensitive subject, but Christ wants us to become um, more like him, right? And I think suffering teaches us humility um, and it teaches us um, yeah, it just guides us to become more and more like Christ. Because I think the flip side, right? If if we lived in a world where there was no suffering, where, 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 as you, Dr. Ross says, no thermodynamics, so we don't feel pain and, and so on, um, then we would become very prideful human beings. We would become, you know, we would. Not, I don't think love. We would not know how to love one another uh, in the same way that that Christ loves the unlovable. So, so I think it's by God's grace that He is created a world where we can experience suffering um, because ultimately as Christians the purpose of suffering is to become more and more like Christ and ultimately on that final day when we get to heaven you know we'll be purified we'll be refined um, and our character will be so close to Christ um, so yeah so that that's my testimony and I hope that that encourages um some of you guys and and a pleasure to be part of the class so thank you dr thank Ross. you john i appreciate that you actually wove two stories into one here because uh, they both have uh, distinct applications i've got really fond memories of that uh, he was one of the few professors there in hong kong who arranged for me to make my first visit to hong kong and uh what i noticed is that the christian professors uh, there in hong kong were very committed uh, to bring people to faith in Christ. And uh, your dad didn't just have me come to one campus. He made contacts with four other campuses. At this. So I got to speak at all the major universities in Hong Kong, uh, thanks to your dad. I also had one other interesting story. Uh, your dad and a couple of professors uh, took me out to a restaurant while I was in Hong Kong. And one of these things, they got a gigantic uh, you know, Lazy Susan with all this incredible food on it. There were about a dozen of us around that table. And your dad said, we actually have proof here in Hong Kong uh, that Eve was not Chinese. Because if she was Chinese, she would have eaten a snake. And they said, and you just ate part of a snake. <laughs> I had no idea what was on that table. It was all really good. Uh, so uh, your dad had a really good sense of humor. So uh, I had no idea he passed away at uh, such a, an early age. So yeah, thank uh, you for that. You've got great memories of uh, a really a great example of uh, what a Christian is all about. Okay, Phil, it's your turn. Okay, you, uh, <clears throat> well, I wanna thank you again for giving me this uh, opportunity for a second uh, bit of testimony here and, and what I've, selected is uh, is a Romans 828 uh, journey which uh, started uh, January 7th 2001 which uh, was the death of my wife uh, uh, extreme period of grief uh, and despair on my part and then all through uh, to April 23rd 2005 my marriage to, to Angela so going from grief to great joy and to give a little background on this, <clears throat> my wife um, had contracted hepatitis C and they're not sure exactly how, but it attacked her liver and she had a, um, a liver transplant in 94 uh, at Cedars. And um, unfortunately, uh, hepatitis C isn't cured by getting a new liver. So the, the hepatitis C attacked her new liver and she actually had to uh, be relisted for a second transplant, which she was very hesitant to agree to, but she did, she did do that. And then in 98, um, I took early retirement from Rocketdyne to provide caregiving to her and be with her full time. Um, and then it, 
in, in early December of 2000, uh, she really took a turn for the worse and I took her to UCLA, which had a very big liver transplant program to the ER up there. And uh, they gave her high priority for a new liver. But she had so many complications uh, that it just wasn't feasible to give her the liver. So uh, I look at it as God basically rescued her from this ordeal. This was occurred on January 7th, uh, 2001. And of course, uh, we, we had been praying uh, constantly that, that, that she would be able to get this new liver. But uh, in a way, that, that, that's a that's a brutal surgery to go through in the recovery. And so she, when I say rescued, I think God saved her from that ordeal. And, and in a sense, it was a, a, a better, a better resolution for her. But this, this was the most, uh, most grief and, and, and despair, depression that I'd really ever experienced. And, um, the only thing my life, everything in my life really, just had no meaning for me, my interests and hobbies and all that. So my, my life thing I looked forward to on a Friday was going to the cemetery, putting flowers down for her. <clears throat> and then that, that they, la they lasted for, for about a week. The, the, the groundskeepers picked them up on Thursday. So each week I, I would do this. Um, and <clears throat> uh, one, one of the things, um, that happened, uh, which, which occurred about a week after the funeral, which, which put me on a, 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 a more intense path to, to uh, revisiting my, my previous years of, 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 of following scripture and being, being more uh, involved in spiritual growth. But I had kind of dropped out of that. And even though Betty and I were raised in Christian families, we, we hadn't really gone to church and and been, been studying scripture. But I got this Bible from a friend of mine, Eric, um, about a week after the funeral. Um, and he on the dedication page, he dedicated Phil, uh, 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 a new year and a new beginning. And um, the, the, the Bible really uh, intensified my interest in, in learning more about God. And uh, the, the, other, the other thing that happened, there was another thing that happened soon after I got the Bible, and I had started reading in Genesis, and I had some questions about the, the six-day creation account there, and I got a call from my friend Norm Helgeson, and uh, Norm um, was asking me, uh, you know, checking in on me and all, and, and I told him, I said, well, I'm getting back into Bible study, and I've got a few questions here about Genesis, and and he says, "Oh, he says, well, you, you need to get this book called uh, the Genesis Question by uh, written by Hugh Ross." And he says, "That'll that 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 should answer your questions." And he says, "And by the way, um, twenty five miles from your house, Phil, he's giving a, he, he has a class in Sierra Madre. You can go to the class, and you can get the book, and it would be a." a nice uh, experience for you here and in, in, in getting through your, your, your depressed period here after Betty's death. So I did that. I went out to the class and I was really impressed uh, with, with you. And, uh, and I ventured over to the book table and I, and I got, <clears throat> I got the book uh, instead of, I think 20 bucks, it was a discount in the Bible class. So I got it for 10 bucks and, and read through that and, and uh, it did answer my question. So now I had two activities, uh, the cemetery and Hughes class on Sunday. And then eventually um, I started to get back in a little bit to some of my other activities, um, playing basketball on Wednesday nights and, and beach volleyball on Saturdays and riding my more various things and my train stuff. So I, I was I was going through the grieving process, trying to heal myself but um then th there was a very strange event that happened this this was uh, it was on a saturday morning in february 2004 so this was uh you know around three years after uh betty's death 
and I was reading the sports section and, and I happened to notice on the back page of the sports section, there was this section called singles connection. And I had never really looked at that before. And I, and I figured with my, my age at that time, 64, and both parents had passed away. My mom at 58, my father at 62. I took social security at 62. I figured I'd, I'd be lucky to make it to 65. The thought of meeting another woman and getting into the dating game, it had just never occurred to me. I, it just, just it, it was not a thought process I had. And, but for some reason, I, I looked at this single scan and there was one ad that jumped out at me. Um, and it was a, a dinner dance in San Gabriel, uh, uh, a Chinese, Chinese buffet dinner for $25 and meet beautiful Asian girls and, and uh, a dance. And, and that's 30 miles from my house. There were other events there that were closer to my house. But for some reason, I focused on that. And I don't know why, but there was a little voice inside of me that said, told me, Phil, you know, why don't you go for it? You got nothing planned here for this. Area. So, so I drove out there and, uh, and I got there a little late. Uh, people had already, some of them finished dinner and were dancing. So I, when I finished my, my meal, I, I happened to look over a few tables away from me and I saw this really attractive gal. And uh, there were a lot of guys at her at the table waiting to ask her to dance and all that. And so uh, I ventured up the, the courage to, uh, to go over and ask her that. And that, this was Angela. Um, and uh, I was expecting rejection. Uh, she looked a lot, uh, very young and also I figured, hey, you know, an old, old guy here asking this young girl to dance, but she, she agreed to. And so it, anyway, that, that was uh, um, certainly an amazing experience for me. Uh, and I found out that she had come here from China in 97. She had wanted to escape from her celebrity life. She, she had been singing opera for 22 years and it was a very structured uh, life. And, and, and so a friend said, well, you know, why don't you uh, think about going to the United States? There's, a, you know, freedom. So she applied for a visa or not a visa, I guess a green card. And uh, the normal waiting time for a green card is like 12, 12 years at that time. She got her green card in two and a half months. And the immigration, US immigration gives a test to people. There's like 10 things that they check off on a list. And I guess if you get two or three, you can get on the list, but eventually you can get a green card. She, she had all 10 checked off. So they really wanted her here and, and, and she did uh, in 97, she, she came here and she said, one of the greatest things that she experienced, she could walk down the street and nobody knew who she was. Uh, she, she didn't have that, that, that curse of being a celebrity, which can be a curse for some people. I mean, your life isn't your own. So she was really, really um, impressed with America. She, uh, she got a job as an activities director at an adult daycare center um, in, in, in Temple City. And uh, <clears throat> she, uh, it, it turned out that uh, this was the first time she had gone to that dance. And it was highly improbable. Uh, there, there was a lady at the, the, the daycare center uh, that had, her, her daughter was the one that organized this dance and asked Angela if she would be interested in going there. And, and Angela kind of put her off for quite a long time. And ultimately she decided, well, she would go that Saturday night to that dance. So. So that was kind of improbable. The first time she went and the first time I went. And um, <clears throat> so uh, it, at any rate, we, uh, we ended up, we, for about a, about a year and three months, we dated and I drove to, to Alhambra three times a week and so on. And, but ultimately um, we, we, we decided, hey, we, we had, you know, found uh, our soulmate in life, so to speak, but we, so we got married. That was the April 23rd, uh, two, 2005 uh, time. And um, the, this, there, there are some other things 
another another bit of scripture that I think can describe some of these events, some of these things that happened to me along the way in my recovery. <clears throat> and that's Isaiah 43, 19, um, which is God is saying, behold, I will do a new thing and it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So <clears throat> God really presented me. He created new things for me in my life. And I think the important thing uh, is to recognize these events and God can create them for you. So uh, I, I, I think I think you just got to have, you know, act on these events and you and, and God can lead you out of whatever the wilderness situation is that you're experiencing in your life. Well, thanks, Phil. I mean, yeah, that was remarkable. I mean, you're, 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 I had no idea you went through that long period of uh, depression. And, yeah. Well, God guided you out, and I mean, we know people who've been in a long period of depression. The thing is, like, there's no way out. You get that impression. Uh, so I love the fact that hey, God always has a way out. Uh, there is a path. It's there, and uh, it can be unexpected. And I love to see your trains in the background. So looks like that's one of your hobbies. Oh yeah, train collecting, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah, once a month we have a train meet, and I would always after your class, I'd go over to the train meet at the uh, Arcadia Masonic Hall there on Doherty Road. So, so, uh, but uh, yeah, that that's been a a very passionate hobby of mine since 1980. Wow. Okay. Well, very good. Oh, well, we're going to transition now to uh, so Mark. I'm going to have you uh, field uh, some some questions. So if there's any questions that people have before we go into our, and what I'm going to do, we got three more passages of scripture we're going to be looking at, but rather than bring them into teaching time, uh, we're going to do that uh, in our uh, uh, web meeting. So when we transition from the webinar to the web meeting, uh, we'll go into those texts and have some discussion on it as a group. Uh, but Mark, we'll take some time now. Uh, how about uh, another 15 minutes for of a Q&A, &A, and then we'll go into our uh, web meeting. Great. We have a, <clears throat> a question from Doug McComb. He says, uh, why during an ice age, the snow and ice creep down only from the North Pole and the North? Why does it not creep up from the South? Is it the tilt of the Earth that influences, or what causes an ice age besides global warming? Well, it actually does creep up from the South. You say, how come it doesn't creep up to the same extent that it did in the north? Well, I mean, if you look at the northern hemisphere, uh, that's where 80% of the land masses are. There's not that much land mass below the equator, and especially when you get below, say, about uh, 30 degrees south, it's almost all ocean, except for Antarctica. And the uh, ice greatly expanded beyond Antarctica during the last ice age. Uh, but for example, uh, most of uh, of uh, Tasmania uh, was covered by thick sheets of ice. And so like the harbor of Hobart uh, was cut out by the retreat of ice from the last ice age. I've been to Tasmania and you can see plenty of evidence of uh, the advance in the retreat of ice uh, from uh, the last ice age. New Zealand, of course, is another place uh, where you can see evidence of uh, the last ice age. In fact, there's still ice on the South Island left over from uh, the last ice age. So yeah, uh, but because the northern hemisphere, especially if you look at the globe, what you'll let, you know, it'd be great if we could show you a map here, but what you notice in the northern hemisphere, not only is most of the land mass on the earth above the equator, most of that land mass above the equator is up around the poles. So if you look at North America, for example, it's shaped like a triangle uh, with most of North America uh, above the uh, you know, the, the 45th uh, parallel. Uh, and likewise, you see that in Asia and Europe, most of the land mass is actually at quite uh, northern latitudes. 
And so that's why uh, you get huge seats of ice uh, covering you know, 55% of North America because of the way North America uh, is shaped and structured. And likewise, virtually all of Siberia uh, gets covered with big sheets of ice. So uh, yeah, it's just the geography uh, that explains the difference. Thank you. Rob Gibson asks about the sun's design. He said, if we keep the mass of a star constant, does adding more metals to the star help increase the temperature of the star or decrease it? And why is that? And then the other half of the question is, are some metals neutron absorbers or emitters in a star? Uh, well, uh, in the nuclear cores of the star, that's where the neutrons have a factor. And so like really massive stars, uh, you will get uh, you know, neutron engagement. When you get a supernova eruption, there's a huge uh, 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 there's a lot of neutrons that are given off. Uh, there's certain kinds of uh, supernova, the really big supernova eruptions are where you get hard processed elements. If you look at the elements in the periodic table that are more massive than iron, about half of those are what we call our process elements. They're elements that are produced uh, where you get intense uh, showers of neutrons bombarding the lighter elements and building them up to heavier elements. And uh, that happens in uh, what we call type two supernovae, the really massive supernovae that erupt. Uh, but we now know that most of the R process elements that exist in the universe are actually manufactured when two neutron stars merge together to become a black hole. Now, the first time that was observed at the gravity wave telescope was about two or three years ago. And they were able to determine uh, that there was a huge amount of R process element formation going on uh, during uh, that event. Now, Mark, I'm probably missing part of that question. So could you review that for me again? Sure, the, the entire question is, if we keep the mass of the star constant, does adding more metals to the star increase its temperature or, de or decrease it? Okay, that's still being researched. I mean, uh, and you know, Rob is on to the right point. And to really answer that question, you need to look, okay, what kinds of metals? And so uh, there's a difference between, say, the iron that you add and the magnesium you add compared to, say, the carbon and the oxygen. So there's no easy answer to that question. It's still being researched. <clears throat> we do see uh, a slight temperature dependence on uh, how what the quantity of that elements heavier uh, than helium uh, in the star. Typically, the more metals you have in the star, the greater the effective temperature of the star. Uh, but it's a relatively minor effect. You don't see a lot of difference uh, between low metallicity stars and high metallicity stars, but we do see some. There is a subtle difference. And what's now being figured out, okay, uh, what, you know, what different kinds of elements heavier than helium uh, impact the effect of temperature in which ways? And uh, the age of the star has a much bigger effect uh, than the metallicity of the star. And so that's difficult. Uh, keep in mind, it's challenging for astronomers to measure uh, the precise age of the star. And given that the age of the star has a far greater effect uh, than the metallicity, if you don't have an accurate age measurement for the star, it's really hard to determine what the impact of the metals are. But where we do have good data, yeah, we do see a subtle effect uh, due to the metals. Thank you. Um, Stephen Posta from Spring, Texas says, uh, <clears throat> the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus was a part of the Trinity that was actively involved in creation. It also indicates that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the evening. He also held at least one verbal conversation with them and likely spoke with them routinely. Is it logical to presume that it was Jesus himself that walked with them in the garden and spoke with them? Yeah, that's a subject of theological debate because we do see instances in the Old Testament uh, where God appears to humans in some apparently physical form. You know, and God the Father and God the Spirit, uh, they're, they're spiritual beings. It's Jesus who has, you know, as it says in the Colossians 2 verse 9, 
the fullness of the deity dwells in Jesus in bodily form. So he is the physical manifestation of the triune God. And so where God appears in physical form, or at least apparently physical form in the Old Testament, uh, Bible scholars presume that's the second member of the Trinity. Uh, so for example, when Jesus, uh, when Abraham was feeding uh, God uh, and the two visitors, uh, it's like, okay, two angelic beings uh, plus uh, God the Son was there uh, uh, presently before him. It is a subject of debate, so there are different opinions on that. Uh, but yeah, there are clear instances where God does appear, just a few, uh, in apparent physical form uh, in the Old Testament. I mean, to me, it's humbling to think that Abraham was actually preparing a dinner uh, for the one that created the universe. Thank you. Mel Peters from Southern California asks, how do you explain different sea levels requiring locks at the Panama and Suez canals? Yeah, we talk about the sea level. It's not the same all over the world. Um, you know, the salinity changes. So for example, the Red Sea is a lot saltier than the Pacific Ocean, open Pacific Ocean. And uh, that has some, and the land masses that are around it. So for example, uh, with the Panama Canal, you got the Atlantic Ocean on one side, the Pacific Ocean on one side, and just a thin strip of land. Of course, you got the reverse in the Suez Canal area where you have all these land masses and just as the relatively tiny uh, bodies of water that will affect the sea level. So yeah, I mean, the sea level is not the same all over the world. It does vary a little bit. And of course, you've got the tides that impact it. Tides will impact different parts of the world in different ways. So the sea level is also time variable and time variable in different ways. I mean, I got relatives that uh, live in Nova Scotia and uh, there they get to see the tide go up and down by almost 50 feet. Uh, whereas where I live here in Southern California, it's just a few feet of tidal up and down. And again, uh, it's the geography. Uh, the Bay of Funday, you've got these land masses uh, creating uh, kind of this uh, tunnel effect that really enhances uh, the tides. Whereas if you're in a, on a seashore where it's just broad open ocean uh, and ocean that extends for thousands of miles out from any land masses, uh, the tidal effects uh, will be significantly, daily tidal effects will be significantly smaller. Thank you. Mark Durham asks, uh, when I see another person in pain or getting pain, I literally feel pain in the most uncomfortable way. Is this the same thing the mice are going through? That yeah, you mentioned earlier? same thing. I mean, uh, and that's kind of what the paper is implying here is that, uh, you know, we humans share a lot in common with mice and rats. And that's one reason why we're able to use mice and rats for medical research. Uh, because of the common designs that we share with them. And what we now know too is that the brain pathways we see in mice and rats are remarkably similar to the brain pathways we see in human beings. That's one reason why I think these authors are relatively confident that the research on mice uh, is going to have significant applications uh, for therapies uh, for human health and brain disorders uh, because of those uh, common designs that we see there. And so yes, uh, just like we see mice, for example, experiencing pain transfer and pain relief transfer, uh, as these authors point out, there's real hope. I mean, we all, obviously many of us have seen this with human beings. I think what the researchers are drawing out, maybe there's a way we can enhance this uh, to help people with pain relief, for example. It's the kind of social engagement uh, the kind of bonding you have in advance that I think will enhance that capability. And if we can nail that down more specifically, I think we can really help people that are going through significant chronic pain. Uh, but yeah, uh, it sounds like Mark has already had some personal experiences of that. And maybe this is because Mark is an especially empathetic uh, human being. He is. <laughs> Thank is you, Mark, Mark yeah. Durham. And the last question is from Esther McCorkle-Oyas from Ohio. And she says, is the seminar on AI available for purchase? Okay, 
the seminar uh, is called a workshop. And for a workshop, because we're basically trying to encourage uh, critique, evaluation, and testing of different components of the creation model we've developed with reasons to believe. And for that reason, uh, when we have a workshop, uh, it's private invitation only. So we invited people like Mark uh, uh, Perez, for example, to be part of it. He's part of our scholar community, has been doing work with us and research and writing with us. So he was invited, but yeah, it was an invitation only. And that's to actually give people a lot more freedom uh, to, uh, you know, if there's no public audience out there, that's going to actually encourage people to be more honest with one another, more critical of what they're hearing. And so uh, that's why we keep it private. Uh, but like with the last workshop, uh, we do intend to make it public. So it was recorded. And in due time, we will make it publicly available. Uh, but and you say, well, how long? Well, we want to wait long enough that we can actually uh, assimilate the benefit of what happened in the workshop. So there's ongoing engagement going on between the participants. But an agreed time, and usually it's about 60 days. After about 60 days, uh, we will make it publicly available. And uh, I'll let people here in the class know when it's available. Just like I did about a year ago uh, when we made available all the video recordings uh, from our workshop on human origins. And so that's still, that's publicly available right now. Uh, you can find it at our Reasons, uh, uh, Reasons to Believe YouTube channel. Our intent is to make this workshop available uh, through the same medium. That's the end of the questions, Hugh. It looks like uh, we're ready to close out. Um, okay, that's great. We can, we'll can we we'll transition to our web meeting. And uh, we're going to end the web meeting at about uh, 1230. Uh, so it gives us about 20 minutes to engage one another. And I'll begin the web meeting uh, by introducing uh, the remaining passages that we're going to be studying in this series. And then next week, we'll actually bring that into the webinar. Uh, but this will be a kind of an advanced thing for uh, the rest of you who want to join us uh, for that web meeting. And with that, let me go to the share feature to give you the URL in case you didn't have a chance to write it down. Okay, the passages we're going to be looking at is Philippians 4, 13 to 14. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. This is Paul speaking. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And what we're going to be discussing uh, both this week and next week, this week in the web meeting and next week in the webinar, okay, we all have regrets. We've all made mistakes. And no, we could have done better. Um, where can we get the energy uh, to better uh, press on? And the application here is, we do not need to defend or be ashamed of the old man. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, uh, the old man has been crucified and a new man or woman has been resurrected as a result. That's really the basis of uh, our water baptism. It symbolizes the death of the free uh, Christian individual and the resurrection of the uh, post-Christian uh, individual. And that's one reason why those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ can joyfully testify of God resurrecting a new man from an old man without shame, without embarrassment. I've heard this from unbelievers frequently, you know, just how unusual it is amongst those of us who are believers, how free we are to share our past failures, uh, our past uh, misdeeds, uh, our past sins and the evil we've committed. Uh, you know, we're free to talk about that without embarrassment or shame because that's been put to death and we've been raised new uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. This is a mark of a true Christian where we can look at that. And Paul is just basically saying here, for that basis, uh, we can put aside uh, what we've done and uh, you know, not dwell on the mistakes we've made in the past, 
realize we've benefited from those mistakes through the work of Christ on the cross, as we heard the testimonies, and basically move on. And then uh, the next passage we're going to look at is in 1 Timothy 4, 15 to 16. Here we got Paul approaching the end of his life. And he's speaking to his protege, Timothy. And he says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save yourself uh, and uh, your hearers. And the point here is, how can we become, we started off with that passage in 2 Corinthians 4. Oh yeah, our bodies are decaying. They're decaying slowly, but day by day our spirit is being renewed. So we're going to kind of close off with this application. How can we become more radiant, gracious, beautiful, wise, disciplined, and loving? How can our doctrine become more biblical? How can our spiritual progress become more visible? How can we save ourselves and our hearers? And one of the things I want us to be thinking about as we go into our discussion time is, you know, here's Paul speaking to Timothy. Um, how many of us have uh, been around someone who's been walking with the Lord for decades, and actually we can see how they have become more radiant, gracious, beautiful, wise, and disciplined, uh, how their spiritual progress is visible, and how it is in being around those people, we can see how they're experiencing sanctification, being delivered from the power of sin over the life and people around them. And all of us have met people uh, who are kind of like the Pauls in our life. And I'm gonna encourage you to actually ponder that a little bit and then maybe uh, give some uh, brief testimonies. So that's where we're going there. And uh, this is the URL you're gonna need uh, to get into our meeting. Uh, and by the way, this will be the same URL we're gonna be using all the way through until April. I'm hoping by April we'll be done with this pandemic. Maybe I'm an optimist, uh, but we'll see how that uh, plays out. So with that, I'm gonna close down uh, the uh, webinar and all of you will need to exit the webinar and then you'll go to that URL and uh, you'll draw it into a web meeting. And please be patient. I need to manually move you from the waiting room into the meeting. Uh, but I'll see your name there and I'll move you in. So just give me a couple of minutes to do that. With that, I'm going to uh, exit the share feature and uh, we're going to end the meeting here. So all of you will be exited out of the meeting and I'll see you in uh, the webinar or the web meeting.